It's good to come to Ireland when you can meet one of your experts, your advisors, actually. So Brian Hone is one of the advisors to the European Cybercrime Center, where we're actually trying to reach out to uh, private sector, to academia, to, uh, to the big uh, businesses in order to get more hands-on frontline experience about what is going on, which we, not, we are not always able to see from our ivory tower in The Hague, even though that we actually spend the most of our times outside The Hague. Cybercrime. I'm in a good mood today, actually. Uh, so uh, I have these two speeches, the one that is very, very fearful and dark, and the one that is slightly more optimistic, and I'll take the optimistic one today. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is, uh, and I'm, uh, we are sometimes in the discussion, I'm considering, are we hyping this too much? Are we, um, are we talking too much about failure and mistakes uh, that, that, that people lose actually interest and confidence and say, well, it doesn't matter what I do anyway because everybody gets breached. And, and are we spending too much wrong money on, on security? And I, I, I wish that I could give you a, a clear answer. My, my intuition tells me no. I think that we need to, to, uh, to every day to discuss this because there is a number of drivers that will change the world as we know it now into the future world, which is not so far away. There are so many drivers that we will have no influence, and especially not from small countries like Ireland or, or Denmark or other ones, that will shape the future in a different way than we used to. So it will mean changes for, for the way that the police works, it will make changes for the way that, that you do and act as a citizens and what you can require for the businesses. And that will give us a lot of new opportunities and loads of growth and, and, and very much welfare also. But it also requires that we just sit down and we talk about this without too many emotions. Because emotions tend to carry us a bit away. And we react in a way that is not always connected with the brain, which I'll advise you to actually interact with in this matter. So I'll give you a, an indication of where I think that the internet will go, what the threat will be, and how we mitigate it. Because, of course, there is also possibilities. So the digital age, and here you see our very um, nice headquarters. It's not paid by the by the EU taxpayers, I might add here. It's paid by the Dutch taxpayers. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but you know, the Dutch, they don't do anything for free. So uh, if they get a, a thousand agents to work in, in this building, they also, after eight, nine years, have a break even, and then they, 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 they get their money back. But the good thing about it is that this is state-of-the-art building and state-of-the-art uh, equipment that we have. It's just very, very, very good. And I cannot complain as a, as a civil servant. This is probably the nicest building I've ever been working in. This is the internet every given day. This is how it looks like now and today. This is where we will see everybody who uses the internet. I would be able to make you a virtual prediction about how it will look like in five years. And then you can put in a lot of, of, of dots here, many more here, and huge numbers out here. We will grow from 2.7 billion users of the internet to 4 billion users. We will also grow from having 8 billion devices connected to the internet to have 24 billion devices connected. And I will not be always be directing the machine. The machine will communicate with other machines via the internet without me knowing it. For instance, my iPhone here knows exactly where I am because I've given it access like anybody else to all kinds of information. So it knows I'm here. It also knows from my agenda that I need to be in the airport at a certain moment. It will warn me if I'm still here and should have been moving to the airport because it can tell me that. But it can automatically actually rebook my flight if I want to, if the setting is right. It can do this without me interfering. So there's a lot of communication going on already between machines. And this will increase with the internet of everything. So we will in the future not have the exclusivity to be without any connection, I guess. There will be sensors all over for the good. So when I'm walking around, my phone will tell me, now you are close to your favorite restaurant, or, or maybe a, a shop that have a bargain on whatever you want. There will be all this kind of communication, because there will be communication in the background. But this will also create a much 
wider attack surface than the one that we see now. And Brian will be one of the advocates for trying to minimize the attack surface. He wants very, very, very little and very narrow attack surface. But by engaging with your fridge, your car, your home, your smartphones, everything is online. You create loads of endpoint accesses also, unfortunately, for criminals. So while the internet is, is, is very, very good, it also has built-in weaknesses. I was in ICANN, and you know ICANN is the closest organization that comes to who owns the internet. They were the one who in invented it. It was a small American uh, NGO, and now it's grown big, and now the Americans are actually stepping out of this because they, they feel that they've been criticized. So it's, it's much more intergovernmental, and it's much more a, a bigger organization. And they said the internet, as we see it today, is a mess. If we, could do, if we could do what we want to do, we will close the internet down for one year and we will rebuild it and it will be both secure and safe and faster. You know this will never happen. Uh, but, but, but this is just to tell you that it was meant to be a small thing that, that grew. If you're a criminal, what do you think of? Uh, what is your driver? Unless you are a serial killer or a rapist, then you are in it for the money. So if we look a bit to the income distribution worldwide, you can see where the money is. And with the more blue, the more money. So where do you think that the criminals will go if they want to have more money? They will, of course, not try to steal from a beggar. They will steal from where the money is. Unfortunately, the money is in the European Union region. It's in the places in the Far East and in the US. It will, of course, also change. But this is the picture right now. So when you see 4 billion users the most of the, of, of the governments and the businesses will see more markets. I am a cop, I see more criminals, unfortunately. So the, the, the ability to do crime is different in cyberspace. You know that if you, you, you live, I guess, in a safe country, you would say that Ireland is, 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 is rather safe. You would say that the police commissioner has the adequate resources. He would probably not agree completely on this, but he, he has the adequate resources to maintain security at an acceptable level. So you will still have homicides, and you will still have maybe uh, robberies and, and rapes, but it's still at an acceptable level. Of course, not for, for, the, for the victim, but for the society. That's because that we have said that this territory of the Republic of Ireland needs so many police officers to create this. And they need these tools and laws to create this level of security. Not more than we might have more security, but less freedom. So we have found a balance. The crime only occurs if you have a perpetrator close to the crime scene in the physical world. So if I want to kill the previous commission, I need to be rather close to him. If I want to rob you or steal you or whatever I can do with you, I also need <laughs> to be a bit closer. Of protection, Mr. Yes, uh, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm really taking care of my words here. Uh, I was not more specific. But it always requires that you are close to the crime scene. So we have our own criminals in Ireland. They are Irish. And then you probably, like the British, will, will claim that the rest of the evilness comes from the European Union, and they travel into your nice country, and they steal left and right. And uh, what you can do is, of course, you can target that, and you can do something, and you can, to a certain extent, border yourself out of that crime. And you can also arrest a perpetrator, and you can put him in front of an Irish court, and you can sentence him, but not in cybercrime. Nobody will move one inch to steal your ideas, your identity, your money, your reputation. Nobody will move an inch. So they will conduct crime from the outside towards nice people here, and they will not even do it from our good friends in the rest of the European Union where we have very good cooperation agreements, so we will even get criminals extradited <coughs> due to the European arrest warrant from other countries. We normally never extradite people, but you do this in the Europe. No, they will operate from outside the European Union. And I can already tell you where they operate from. In our cases, they operate from Russian-speaking territory outside the European Union. It might not continue to be in that way. It might change, but this is the picture that we see right now. In the normal world, I can only kill one at a time. I can only rob one house at a time. In cybercrime, Brian can set up a system and he can port scan and he can uh, access your one million computers in 20 countries in 20 minutes while he's sleeping. This is a, a difference in magnitude and in impact. So the police way of thinking 
crime scene, a border jurisdiction. It's more or less dead in cyberspace. We have to find other ways to prevent it and to protect and to, to see if we can, can manage to make it unattractive to be a cyber criminal. This one will only work if, uh, if I had a mouse, which I don't have. I don't know if this works. Yeah. It does? So I might be able to show you this. This is, this is the world now. This is attacks and intrusions on the internet, and these are where they originate from, and so these are the receivers. <coughs> on the left side, you can see the countries that originates the, the attacks from. Here you can see who receives the attacks, and here you can see the IP addresses and what kinds of tool is done. So while you and I speak here, and we think that we are relatively safe, this is going on every day. This is only, look at Africa. <laughs> Uh, so if anybody thought that nothing was going on in Africa, you have to rethink. But this is because that the criminals are operating from these areas, not necessarily that this poor country is very criminal. This is only based on less than 1% of the activity of the Internet, this picture. So you can, this is a, a, a multiplication of activity. But it shows you the activity that the criminals are doing every day. And it's also not a precise picture. Because you cannot always follow, and again, Brian is an expert here, you cannot always follow a trace and see that you go back to a certain computer. It could be your computer who is the attack computer because you're part of a botnet, but you don't even know it. Your computer has been compromised. The only thing that the criminals want is a part of your bandwidth to utilize this to paralyze somebody else. So we could all be a part, and sometimes you cannot always follow that. Some statistics, new internet users every year, internet users worldwide, it's all already not 2.7 but 2.9. Look at the monthly online threats worldwide. Look at the websites that have been hacked so far this year, emails sent just today. And then look at how big these numbers are. And if you think we can only protect us out of this, you probably have to rethink. So. What, is, what are the challenges? The challenges is, for me, that we have two types of cybercrime. The traditional cybercrime, which can only be done on a computer. This is hacking, cracking, this is intrusion. This came with a new tool. And then the other part of the coin, the cyber-facilitated crime. This is that organized criminals are now using the internet to optimize the business model and to utilize it to even earn more money. And I will show you a bit what, what they do uh, later. If we look at actors at the internet, you will see four big groups of actors. Extremists, left and right. You see them, they, they are active. This is not uh, my major concern. This is for the intelligence services to look at this. Then you have terrorist-related activity. There is no terrorism going on at the internet right now. Uh, there's no evidence, but terrorists are just like everybody else. They use it for radicalization, facilitating, and for earning money to support their activities. So you will see loads of closed forums where you might not go in, where you will see 16-year-old uh, young immigrants who don't really feel integrated in, in where they are looking at beheadings of American soldiers again and again and again, and snipers operating in, in Iran or Iraq which kills soldiers very efficiently, and they create this kind of wish to be part of that, to have some pride, and you will see this. This is a huge problem. We see it right now in increasing numbers with the foreign fighters to Syria, basically on both, both sides, both them that want to support ISIS and the other ones who want to fight ISIS. Then we have state-sponsored activity, and of course we need to talk about that. The best hackers in the world are states. It's not criminals, it's states. Um, and they are always a bit ahead, uh, technologically wise, uh, than, than the criminals, but not more than one to two years, and then the criminals catch up. So, and they also use this, the, the spillovers. This is also not my primary concern. I think that I've said millions of times before that states spy on each other. They've done this since the Viking Age, and they will continue to do so in these online times, what they look at in our countries and what they will be monitoring in your country is your weaknesses in your critical infrastructure. So they will be looking at ways in order to, if 
which nobody believes, but if there will be a war, they will of course start in cyberspace with a, a, a disinformation campaign to, um, to tell you that something is going on in this side, but it's actually in that side, and then they will take down your grids, they will take down your communication, your television, your lights, your control towers, your systems, and it will become dark, and then the soldiers will come. This is how it will, but this is why we have the military defense and intelligence, and they will take care of that, and that's another business. There's no reason to be afraid of this, because this has, will always happen, and in the old days it just happened with physical spetsnats that would do this and kill key persons and, and, and do what, whatever, now it's just done online. But of course it's an area that somebody needs to look at. I'm fully booked with looking at organized crime, I can tell you. So I have enough on my plate, and this is what we are looking at, basically. And as I told you, there are two crimes Cybercrime, traditional and cyber facilitated crime. And they operate now in, in, in a way that they use hacking, Trojans, malware, spyware, DDoS attacks, bots, darknet, encryption, virtual currencies, and what is worse, crime as a service. I've been quoted that I said that I, I believe that there is a limited number of very, very, very good programmers in the world, and I still believe that. This is not a huge number of people who have this ability. And we have seen a number of those being taken out by the American police or the Russian police, and you can see the impact immediately because they, they are missed. They are missed in the way to drive certain forms of malware, but of course other ones will take over. So you have groups, and I think that we have a short presentation on this, that you have malware producers, very, very good programmers, excellent programmers, um, and they send malware to another group which will test this malware, if it can penetrate the various antiviruses. So if you have roughly, I think, 72 antivirus products uh, on, uh, working right now, they will test it against this, then they will send a message back and say it will go through 90%, but not all. If you tweak it like this, it will. And uh, they will send it back, and then they will deploy the malware normally as crime as a service from bulletproof host services and bulletproof means that it's not always easy to identify. And here you see the, the, the pyramid. But in cybercrime, what's important for us is to monitor this area because as soon as it gets down here, everybody can be a cyber expert and cyber criminal. You can be a cyber criminal. My experts always say to me, Tors, if you're low in money, give me 1,000 euros and I'll give you 30,000 back next month. And he's probably right. He can do this and he can even give me 300,000. It's so easy because you can rent all your tools and you can act as a cyber expert and they have everything for sale, also money mules. They operate in two areas, the, the, the deep net and the dark net. And the dark market is predominantly Tor-based service. And for those of you who don't know the tour base, uh, it is a system that they disable the ability to identify the IP address that is doing the communication. So I can follow the activity, but we cannot identify. This is done by the American Navy, thank you very much for this, and, um, and it's very efficient, and uh, it cannot be, uh, be um, penetrated. There, 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 there can, of course, be some kind of vulnerabilities from time to time, but in general terms, it cannot. The, the idea was good. The idea was a, a very good idea to have a place where freedom fighters and other ones could communicate secure from governments we do not like. Unfortunately, uh, the criminals saw the opportunity also, it was very, very good, also to operate crime here where you cannot be discovered. So well, if you want, I don't know how things work here in this country, but if you want to have a uh, joint or you want to uh, have some cocaine to the nose or whatever. Maybe I can ask the police chief where you would, where you would go if you want to, to buy stolen goods. I guess, I guess you have areas where I'm you can no buy hands things. Off now for that. This is done physically. Now you do it online. Now you go to Silk Road 2 and you say, I want some cannabis. It should be this quality. I want some LSD and I also want that. And it will be delivered to you by the mailman or by a courier and you can pay with virtual currencies, everything can be done online. This is a business model that, of course, makes it much safer to be, and I will guess 
that, that big uh, distribution of, 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 of drugs will be done by drones in the future, that you create a distance between you. I would at least not. Why should I go over several borders if I could... And here you have uh, one kilo, Brian, in your garden, and I'll drop it from 100 feet uh, above, and if there is anybody taken, it, it won't be me at least. You can buy guns. You can buy stolen goods, you can buy credit card information, you can buy identities, you can buy whatever you want here. Now you will say, like I said, ah, ha, ha. but if you cannot identify as police, how can I then, if I want to buy something, be sure that this guy will not cheat me? And they will. Crooks are always crooks, so they will also cheat you if they can, of course. So you might order five grams of cocaine, you pay, you never receive it. Fine. What have they done? They have, of course, created a TripAdvisor system for this. So they rate uh, the various services. You can get five stars if you deliver in time and whatever, and you can get one star and a warning. So you can actually search and you can also get a direction to who's really good and who has the best cannabis in the world. And here are some of, 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 of the web pages if, if you want to have inspiration to where you can go. And then we have another service which is more in the cybercrime area. The cybercrime guys, they don't use the tour service, they use the deep net. And they use instead peer-to-peer -peer and forums. So they discuss together in closed forums where it's very, very difficult for law enforcement to get in. We are of course not idiots, so we try to get in. Uh, and we sneak in if we can, and we try to be, but it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. The normal rules here is that if you don't upload something yourself in very short time, you're kicked out. They know that this is people who shouldn't be there. And it's very difficult for police legally to upload child sexual abuse material or very dangerous malware because we are simply not allowed to it, and rightfully so. But that simply is just a practical problem. But you can go there, and you can go in. And you can discuss if you have something to offer. So we have created a play field which is rather secure for criminals globally, not just in Ireland or in the European Union, but globally, to share ideas and knowledge on how to become even better criminals and how to avoid any kind of penetration. And we will, for instance, in these sites, we will also see police material circulated. So if they grab something, I always said that loose lips sink ships so if we cannot keep a, a, a secret, we need to improve this because they will also use our weaknesses to try to bypass us. And here are all the various sites. And, uh, and if you pay for a malware, you even get an SLA. So uh, if it doesn't work, you have somebody to complain to, and that will help you tweak it a bit so that you better can get your botnet to work. So this is, is a bit about the challenges that we see. So what happens is that, that it's deployed to a number of, of criminal groups, as you can see here, and, and these criminal groups will download the malware and then they will use it. They could be tech savvy or they could be organized criminal groups that just are muscling in because this is a new profit area. There's a high profit, a very, very low risk, unfortunately, in cybercrime. So this is what, what we see here and, and then they distribute it. And it could be in, uh, in click fraud, it could be in... Um, in ransomware, it could be in Trojans and, and, and whatever. And it could also be in APTs, and this could be in more sophisticated attacks. And even your inbox, if somebody knows your email address and maybe your credit card number, this combination can give big troubles, not just because you, you, you say that yeah, maybe um, my credit card company will, will pay, but you could also get a subscription to a, a new phone to a, new, uh, to a new service, to maybe an illegal service, to a porn site, to whatever, done on this. And to get rid of this when the bills start you know, dripping into your mailbox is very, very difficult. And many people have huge problems. And you actually see people where the criminals, they conduct crime in their identities. And of course, the police jump for the easy and the quick win. And if you said, I'm innocent, Everybody in jails are innocent, you, you know this, so we always call, catch the, the wrong ones. So to persuade this can be sometimes difficult. That's also why I always urge you to take privacy very, very, very um, serious. I think everybody has a right to privacy. Um, the question is, does everybody have a right to anonymity? 
And, and I think this is, is, is more questionable. So what you see normally is the tip of the iceberg. This is where all the nice things are going on and all the bad things are here where I unfortunately spend the most of my time together with, with the experts. And this is a booming business and this will be an increasing business and we need to do something about it and of course we are. So there will be budget command and control sensors and uh, there will be lots of money cash out either in cash or in, in credit card, in, in prepaid credit card with no identity or through money mules or virtual currencies, which we also see. There's a huge boom in virtual currencies for criminals. It doesn't uh, say that everything going on in virtual currencies is criminal. By far, no. But it's an unregulated area. And if it, because it's unregulated, it tends to be uh, attractive for those who don't want to have their identity known. And you can actually also reverse and you can erase your transaction trail. So this is what, what we do in the European Cybercrime Center to, to assist. And we have in EU a cybercrime strategy. So I have seven departments in total, four in operations and three in strategy. And this is how, how, how we work. Uh, and we work in these areas. The first area is cyber intelligence. This, I, I guess, is key. To know what's going on, that, that's why we have contacts with experts in the security that also knows what's going on. So we get feed, feeds from all kinds of partners. And I must say, I'm very, very satisfied in my job. I get so much information from very reliable and very good sources that I cannot complain. My practical complaint sometimes can be that the magnitude of the information sometimes make it difficult to assess the problems because there's also bicycle thefts at the internet, so to say, and we need to focus on a bit higher in the food chain than that. But cyber intelligence is very, very important. And then the three core areas, intrusion, only be done on the internet, online payment, fraud, which is normally um, credit cards, but it will move. I have Apple Pay. Pay now on this. Oh, I haven't tried it because I don't know if it will, will it work in Ireland. No. Okay, but 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 this will replace. You know, money will be at a museum together with the Roman coins, and uh, and then we will have other means. But that will also mean that this one will be the target. And you and by having this one, I'm not online pushing myself online and going offline. Do you remember in the old days where we went to work and then we started our computers, we took a cup of coffee and waited a bit, and, 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 and then when we, when we went home, now we are online always, right? So we move a bit from the PCs to the tablets, and we will have wearable things, and we will have uh, Nike fuels, and we will have everything, and we will be online always. But that also will make a difference in the way that we pay and we need to be in this, also in the discussion with the European Central Bank, what kind of criteria should we give to private companies? Because private companies, they look at security in a different way than law enforcement does. We are a bit naive. We try to solve the problem. We try to do the best. In the private sector, you try to find a balance where you have a break-even that doesn't ruin you, but on the other side, it doesn't ruin you also in making it too, too secure. And you, you are the most loyal ones of all of of, of, uh, and you are the reason that, that the companies are driving in that uh, direction because we don't, as consumer, want a, we might want a system that is secure, but we want it to be transparent at least. And then we want it to be convenient, right? But convenience always trumps security, I can guarantee. So you will never have a system that is so cumbersome to click into. No, 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 no. i rather take the risk. So the trick is to find a way in the future for the private companies and businesses, if they want to stay in business, to find a system that normally is secure and it's convenient and it's transparent. And these three, you will normally, see, normally say pick two, right? But here you have to say pick three <laughs> because you need it. Those who can do this trick, they will be in business. The rest will probably fade out very, very slowly. Then we have Child sexual exploitation, everybody hates this. This is a, unfortunately a, 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 an area that I've been dealing with since 2001. And when I was a young cop, you could get this in kiosks, you know, and, and, and now the magnitude of this material and the development of it, I, I, I simply don't get it, but we have 
56,000 customers here, unique. And they are not just showing pictures of babies, but they are showing pictures of babies being penetrated by two men and then they put a cigarette on their skin afterwards or beat them or whatever. So, so it's, 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 it's very, very bad, these areas that we go. But this is, seems to be an exclusive area that they use because they, 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 they feel rather secure on this. But that's also an independent crime area. But what links it to the other two areas is the expertise that these guys have in using some of the technical facilities. And this is also a good uniter in law enforcement. I can work with the Chinese and the Russians in this, like this. They will have Russian police officers in EC3 working on this, and we have had it. We have a global task force working on this. Everybody unites on this. As soon as you go to some of the other areas, it tends to be a bit of national security issues, but we try to move this also. Then I have three strategic uh, out, uh, areas. Outreach is the, by far the most important. Outreach is where we reach out to the private sector. I think that the police, as we were, I grew, grew up, the customers came to me, right? Um, if you have any complaint, you came to me, and I, mm, maybe I'll do it today, maybe tomorrow. This is not the way that the police can work these days. This is a two-way street, and we need all the information, all the cooperation we can get, and luckily, again, we, we get it. So my outreach team has a target of, of signing 25 MOUs this year, and they have, they, we will turn 21 this year because we signed with McAfee today. So, uh, so we have signed with McAfee, with Semantic, with Apple, with, um, with uh, Kaspersky. I would also praise Kaspersky Lab. Uh, he has right now uh, staff in the European Cybercrime Center, experts training my staff in some of the mobile device uh, technologies that, that, that this company is an expert in. Australia, the, the, the development side is the area where we're looking not at the cyber intelligence, which was fast and a short range radar, but this is more the long. If we go up in the helicopter, where can we see the internet moving towards, which is very difficult because I'm not able to predict the internet in five years' time. We tried to do it with the 2020 scenario. We invited all the big companies, and then we asked them in the same room, where is the money? Where do you see the money? Because the money drives the internet. So where do you see the new applications? Where do you see the new services? And if this happens, what will the downside be for law enforcement? And where do we need to prepare with legislation, with training, with capacity building awareness? And then we have made a number of, 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 of scenarios. But I would guess that, that the drivers, I told you, there will be more internet, will be more online, there will be more crime, that there will be more difficult crime for the police because will will be a, a reality in a couple of times. And I also think we will change. We have hired a Irish psychologist, I guess. We are very fond of Irish. Uh, my head of operation is also Irish, Paul Gillen, which I stole from you, a very good man. Uh, the Irish is actually quite good, I must say. It's not just because I'm in Ireland. We have loads of good Irish. But she is driving a, a project looking at how do we change as human beings on the Internet? How do we react? We react in one way in the physical environment. So if we have a, what is called a bystander effect. If we see somebody getting mocked or raped, we react in a certain way. There is patterns. But how do we react on the Internet? How do we look at mobbing or crime at the internet and what? And where should the police be? Is it needed for the police to be patrolling empty streets when the kids are in the virtual streets? Or should we also be patrolling on the virtual streets? And if so, what should our uniform be? And, and how could we define where is open rooms and where is private rooms? Just like in the public area outside. The police officer know exactly where he can walk. He's not going into any private rooms unless he has, you know, some kinds. And we have to find the same at the internet because I think lots of us sometimes want to be, have advice that we see something, can I do this? Officer, you are here. Is this normal? No, I will have a look. Fine. We, 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 we have to create this. So, so we look at this in strategy and the development. And then we have forensic expertise. This is the best use of EU money I've seen. This is how to build projects and tools for law enforcement in all 28 states using community money. 
Instead of every country try to invent the wheel, why not put the requirements for the wheel in one pot and ask the EU to pay using European companies and give it back to the member state? And then we have also a rather substantial capacity of helping member states. We have very, very good tools for decryption and, 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 and password cracking. Because I believe that the internet is a shared resource. The internet, it doesn't belong to anybody and not to any country. It's just like the big seas, it's like the air that we breathe. We have agreements for this. Nobody can say, this is only my air. If you pollute it in one country, it has an effect on other ones, and the same with the sea. We've managed this with maybe not so efficient Kyoto agreements, but I think we need a cyber agreement. We need to have norms that gives us indication what is right and what is wrong. We have, for instance, for war a Geneva Convention. That does not prevent soldiers from conducting war crimes, but we can come after them afterwards. And we can say this we will not accept, and we can put them in the, in, in, in the tribunals. We need something. And because I, need, I think it's so inclusive, I need to reach out to everybody. So this is how our program board looks like. This is predominantly uh, EU agencies, because I don't want to risk any turf wars or any kind of uh, competition. There is so much crime in cyberspace, there is enough for everybody. So we don't need to, to compete, we need to work together. So you can see here that hopefully Interpol is here. So Interpol will be part. Nobuo Nagatami, who is a very, very good Japanese chief of the Interpol Singapore Digital Center, he is part of my board and I'm part of his board. So he knows exactly what we do, we know exactly what he does, and we try to align this instead of fighting of the scarce resources. And then I have my, my advisory groups, in, in which Brian is here in the Internet Security, very, very good group. Not just a talk shop, but a very, very good group, where we also do things, again, based on rules and regulations and transparency, but a very, very good group. We have a financial service group, and I've just signed a um, MOU with the European Banking Federations and the British Banking Federation in order to improve this work. And this, I hope, will pay off already tomorrow. Let's wait and see. Uh, but the, the banks are, have changed. They do not compete in security. They compete in everything else, but not in security. And I think that they realize that the, that the cyber crooks out there might attack my bank now, but tomorrow it's your bank or your bank. So why not share these information with each other so you can patch up? And why not share it with law enforcement so we can identify the crooks because we need to identify and hunt down the wolves. If we only look at protection, there will be so many cyber criminals and we cannot protect us out of this. We also have to make it unattractive and that's what we do in that way. So we have established the European Union Cybercrime Task Force. So we have a group where the chiefs of all 28 cybercrime agencies meet six times a year. And then we have, and this again thanks to the Irish, we have the ECTEC group which is driven heavily by Ireland, which is the police material, training materials that we try to broaden. Because we need to work in three areas, the three Ps. Prevention, protection, prosecution, and in that order. The more we can prevent, and it's more needed to prevent in cyberspace than in the physical space. The more we can protect, it's more needed to protect here than in the physical world. Look at your locks in your home. Huh. I can probably go through the, your door in five seconds if I want to. Because you only have one because you live in a nice neighborhood, right? And because the police is keeping crime down, so it's unattractive. Imagine that you really want to prevent crime, then you have to do it in, in a different way. So, so this is what we do with, with the awareness. And then we have the industrial cross-sector development and what I talked about, the cyber psychology. I think that police needs to know. I've learned that 12-year-old kids with a cyber problem will never ask their parents. They will never inform your parents. They will sit in their basement room having troubles. Somebody asks them, couldn't you send me a picture of your tits? Back and forth, up and, and down, and, and, and they end up by doing it. And then this guy will say, either you pay, either you give me sexual satisfaction or whatever, or you will see this on your Facebook site. And actually, kids will commit suicide, some of them. Luckily, some will not all, but, but the whole process where, why did you do this? And the communication here, I think we lack between parents 
and them. And sometimes we also have to realize that we might create other ways for youngsters to interact with like-minded age instead of their parents, because otherwise we miss the target. So I, I need to know much more about how, how we act and, and interact at the internet, and that's why we are paired up with the, with the psychologists. And then the initiatives that we have is uh, we have created the European Financial Cybercrime Coalition. This is a very, very important tool for us. Then we have the forensic expert tools. This is an even more important tool. I need, it, I need us to create standards in cyberspace. The most costly part of cyberspace is us creating evidence that I can use in a court. It cannot be inadmissible. I need it to, 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 to actually last. But I also need a German forensic report to actually work in an Irish court. Otherwise, you have to redo it, and it will cost you a fortune. We need to create standards. We are doing this in these various areas. We train people in the same way. We examine them in the same way. They do it in the same way. The next step is if we can do this in the EU, why not do this in Africa? Because in the future, we will need help from the Africans, and they will need help to, to protect themselves. This is a social responsibility that I think that we as EU could take upon us. And, and, and by that, we will do something good that might even also give us more customers to our industry and businesses. Then we have a working group on e-commerce fraud. I'm sure you don't know how big the problem is, but there is a huge number of gangs buying Apple uh, commodities, bicycles, rather expensive goods from very, very small e-shops based in the various countries. So a Danish shop will get somebody who wants to buy a, a Mac... Book Pro. He will pay with a stolen credit card, and the shop will want it to be sent to a Danish address, otherwise they will be suspicious. So they have mules in Denmark, so they send it to the mule, the mule receive it, the mule have already got from the, from, from the gang a lot of boxes with names on and everything paid, he just goes to the post office, they will mail it to a, another European country uh, that used to be part of the Soviet Union in the old days, and from there it will go to a big uh, storehouse and driven into Russia. <clears throat> the problem is you don't lose money because it's your credit card because you didn't do the transaction. The bank don't lose money because the bank said we don't want to transfer this money to your shop because you were an idiot and sold these things. So the only one who loses is the small shop with six employers and they go down the drain. That's why we have to do something about this and have to start a targeted approach towards this and we will do this and we are already looking at a number of good operations. And the last I'm very, very proud of is the Joint Cybercrime Action Task Force. The first time in the EU's history we have a real task force, not just a task force by name, everybody has a task force, but a real task force. Fifteen police officers, experts working day out, day in, 24-7 in one room, targeting crime and doing something about it. It's led by the UK. It's interesting, uh, it's, you, you, UK is not always uh, very EU friendly. Uh, maybe I can say this without offending anybody. But at least they see in cybercrime, we have to be united. So UK leads this. They actually also lead the EU CTF, the European Cybercrime Task Force. And then it's France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Austria, the Netherlands, FBI, Secret Service, ICE, AFP, Canada, RCMP, Colombia, and two or three other countries in this. They have experts, and they are producing cases every day. And this is how they work. They look at the identification of priorities, because every country needs to have something. So if it's a small country, they also need to be part of the full show. So it cannot just be driven by the big countries. All of us should have a pile, uh, of, uh, a, a, a portion of the pie, and then we go into to, to investigations. And here are the objectives that we need to be proactive, intelligence-led, and coordinated, and that we need to go towards the biggest criminals. So these are the areas of competence. High-tech crimes, as it's called here, it's the program as I talked to you about. Crime facilitation is a network that facilitates this. This might be bulletproof hosting services. Online fraud, this is what's going on when we move to this, and then child sexual exploitation online is in but not on right now because the most of the member states have a separate unit for this. So we probably create a task force two that will take care of this. And we are discussing this with the FBI who has a global task force and we might share with the FBI this responsibility so we host it, 
but it's a global task force but hosted by EC3. But in that way, we might be able to actually move a bit faster in this area. Law enforcement's uh, ability to identify, attribute, and prosecute in the post Snowden era. This is one of my favorite uh, subjects, and Brian is not always uh, agreeing with me. Uh, but, but how do we get this right? As I said to you before, in the physical world, you accept that I, as a police officer, have the rights. We, we have all kinds of privacy rights in, 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 in the normal life, right? But still, I can take away your freedom. I can arrest you. I can frisk you if I have a suspicion. I can probably use this on you if you, if you do anything. I can go home to you and I can search your house. If I have a, a suspicion, I can probably bug your phone. In Denmark, I can bug your room. I can put a surveillance team. I can have cameras all over to follow your movements. And eventually, I don't know how it is here, but I can kill you. In Denmark, I have a gun and I can kill you. Because we have rules for this of engagement and transparency, we accept this as citizens that we have given these powers to the police because they will only enforce this according to a very strict rule and because of the rest of us. So for the first time we have a society where it's not force who is power, but it's right that is power. But as soon as I talk about this in the online world, I get hammered with tweets left and right. And I think that the discussion is that is privacy the same as anonymity? Would we accept a society where you have no registration plates on your cars and you could have a mask and if I drove 100 kilometers where I was 50, nobody cared because the police could not identify it. Of course not. If you could conduct any crime, if you had areas that I could not penetrate. If I knew that there were illegal immigrants here or two tons of cocaine, if I knocked the door, there was a lock I couldn't open physically. They could just be standing at the other side. Would we accept this in any physical world? I doubt it. And what kind of world would it be if you had full anonymity? I think that you need anonymity, but it's a right that you only have if you don't break the rules that is set by the society in a democracy. That can be leveled, of course. So you have to look at security here and freedom here and privacy, and then you have to find the right balance. But there will be trade-offs, ladies and gentlemen. And I have still to see the argument that convinces me that because I do a crime on the Internet, I should have the right to continue to be without any identification possibilities. And again, I am not, even though I'm always being accused for, yeah, you're the law enforcement. We have seen this with the NSA trolls. You want to snoop. You want to look into everything and, and, and monitor. No, this is not my job. I'm trying to fight crime. The only ability I want is if we, I have a suspicion that can be proven to such a level that an independent judge will grant me the authority, then I need the authority to see what you are doing. This is what a normal society needs in order to enforce democracy. If you don't want that, fine with me. I rest my case. I will survive. But the, but the big question is, what kind of society will we have? I don't say it's easy to fix, and I actually think that encryption in the online world is here to stay. And I think it's easier to encrypt than to decrypt. So we are probably always, to a certain extent, losing that part. But then we have to find alternatives. We are only here to protect the citizens according to open and transparent rules. You set the rules, and we will enforce this. Thank you very much for listening.